This is episode 128 of the Death to Tyrants podcast. I want to tell you guys about a great sponsor of the Death to Tyrants podcast, and that is our friends over at Zippix Toothpicks. These are flavored toothpicks. They've got several great flavors. Check these out. Cinnamon, clove, mocha, and whiskey even. But not only that, each toothpick actually contains nicotine, and I use these toothpicks all of the time. Not only are they a great alternative to that nasty habit you may be trying to stop, and that includes vaping, come on now, but they taste great. They are way more socially acceptable. They are cheaper than any alternative. Hell, I don't even dip or smoke or anything like that, and I still love these Zippix toothpicks. Out of all the alternatives on the market, these are the most cost-effective, and better yet, they are a sponsor of this show. When a small business is out there helping to support one of your favorite Liberty podcasts like this one, let's thank them by returning the support. Since you are a loyal listener to the Death to Tyrants podcast, you will get 10% off of your order by entering promo code DTTP at checkout when you order over at zippixtoothpicks.com. Once again, go to zippixtoothpicks.com. That's Z-I-P-P-I-X toothpicks.com. And type in promo code DTTP for Death to Tyrants podcast at checkout, and you will get 10% off of your order, and you will be supporting Zippix and Death to Tyrants at the same time. So go do it. Let's get to the show. The crushing weight of the tyrant's passage has left nothing unmarked. You can't split in fucking half, but I call him the hologram graph. But I am the center inside the placenta of math. You clash with cyanide gas and die fast. Rhythmically equivalent of solids, liquid, and gas. We smash a science with the power of Lord Titus. But I am the virus inside of the iris of Cyrus. What's up, you guys? Welcome back once again to the Death to Tyrants podcast. As always, I am still your host and humble narrator, Buck Johnson, now coming to you out of Lockhart, Texas, and uh, sipping on a little bit of whiskey and ready to tell you about the interview I've got for you today. That is with my friend Tho Bishop over from the Mises Institute. He's an editor over at Mises Wire, and he's co-host of one of my favorite new podcasts, and that is Radio Rothbard. And I say new podcast, it has been around for a bit, but they've kind of redone some things over there and the uh, format's a little bit different than it used to be. We're going to talk about that with Tho, obviously. But for those of you that follow Tho, and if you don't, you should, his uh, social media presence is really good. And and he's very good at uh, putting his unique takes on the politics of the day, not just you know, philosophical, classical stuff that some of us are interested in, but the politics of the day, the election coming up. And as we record this, last night was the final debate. So how can we not get into that? My own take on it is it was a little more impressive than the last one, though actually we get into this, he he likes the uh, WWE nature of the first one. I actually liked the calmness of this last one, even though I am a WWE fanatic. That's a different story. But I thought certainly the moderator was better, although obviously still slant to the left, but better than Chris Wallace, no doubt about it. And I I thought Trump handled himself a lot better. And I think Joe Biden was still his fairly calm self. Joe Biden's political, his whole demeanor to me is antiquated. And you might say, well, of course, he's he's been in you know, look how old he is, look how long he's been in this game. But uh, the Trump moment in 2016, honestly, the 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 lead up to it in 2015 kind of changed a lot of things. And, and so some of that old style political demeanor and we must work together. That's what this country is about. Everyone together. It's just so antiquated. And I, you know, Trump is one of the things he's good at is lifting the mask off. Unfortunately, not the COVID masks. He's good at lifting the the mask, so to speak, off of people, the disguises off of people. And so since he's done that to so many people, the media, most politicians, when they try to go back to that, it seems really silly and canned. So I do think Joe Biden's got that kind of demeanor and I think it kind of shows in 2020 for sure. 
And but he's kind of trying to work with it. I suppose his whole thing is recapture that, you know, that old feeling, blah, blah, blah. I thought Trump did a good job at saying, you know, you're over there sitting around like, you know, you're just sitting around like a good old boy at the at the table with your family and you're so wholesome. You're a corrupt politician. And I think that's good. I think most of us know that. I don't know how many people watching that debate know that. But something I thought was interesting last night is early on, they were talking about COVID and Trump's job of managing it and what Biden would do different, of course. Well, Biden brings up the death count, supposedly, from COVID, with COVID, however you want to categorize that. And obviously, he's blaming it on Trump. And the number, you know, is around 200,000. And Biden looks over and says, anyone responsible for the deaths of 200,000 people doesn't deserve to be president. And immediately, my mind went to the Iraq war. Trump missed this opportunity to get a historic burn on Biden here. One for the ages. All you have to do is look over at Biden and say, okay, then you were the ranking member on the Foreign Relations Committee leading up to the war in Iraq, one of the main loudest voices pushing for the United States to go to war in Iraq. So you want to talk about responsibility for over, way over 200,000 dead people that you don't get to be president. You don't deserve to be president. And that is the truth. If, If you had a large part in the biggest foreign policy blunder almost in American history. I mean, that could be debatable, but let's at least say of this generation, the past few generations, then the one thing you don't get to do is be commander in chief. And I I do feel that way. And uh, Trump missed a good one there. And I was was almost yelling at the TV for him to say it. I tweeted it out. I'm sure a lot of you guys saw it. I got quite a bit of traction, but yeah, I found that part interesting as well. There was some A lot of interesting moments, and we'll get to a lot of those with Tho here on the show. Uh, Also, Tho is well-versed on Murray Rothbard, Hans Hermann Hoppe, and those guys have have and had some strategies for reaching out and having alliances with populists. They talked a lot about the populist right, and you know, Rothbard wrote about strategy for the right. So we get into that stuff, and And uh, we get into some Libertarian Party politics. And uh, I think this is going to be something you're really going to enjoy. I love talking with Tho. Uh, Like I said, Radio Rothbard, one of my favorite new podcasts, and I highly recommend that. Let's waste no more time. My guest today from the Mises Institute and Radio Rothbard, Tho Bishop. Welcome to the show. How are you, man? Glad to join you. Thank you for having me back on. Yeah, we got some, I would call it fun topics to cover today, but I want to do something I don't usually do, and that's have my guest plug something at the beginning of the show. And I want to do it because Radio Rothbard is something I catch immediately as it pops up into my podcast feed. It's almost immediately played in my ears because I'm liking it so much. Can you talk about that and what you guys are doing over there? It's changed a little bit, I know, as of late, and uh, I want you to tell the people about that podcast. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, so we've changed the format a little bit. Originally, it was kind of Ryan McMakin kind of largely reading articles as you know some of the ones that came out and um, adding a little bit of extra commentary. And then with the Institute, we started doing audio Mises wires and, and doing a lot more of that for our, you know, our wire content. And so we wanted to kind of change the format a little bit to add, you know, keep, we, we love the branding. Radio Rothbard had a, had a good sound to it. And particularly given this, you know, the, the political circus that we're in, um, we thought, well, you know, let's try to do kind of a Rothbardian political podcast um, with, you know, with, with our own kind of unique angle there. And so we've been having fun because, um, you know, obviously I've, I've always been, uh, you know, one of those sick people that have enjoyed the political side of uh, the, the game a little bit more than, than a lot within the Institute's orbit. Um, you know, I, I think that... Uh, you know, I, I don't think there's any you know contradiction there between being a good anarchist and also kind of enjoying uh, uh, politics and all of its absurdity at times. And and really, you know, what we've been exploring the last few weeks is kind of the, the democracy question. You know, because you have a lot of people that I think that you know they we understand that okay, we we want to live in a world without the state, and they conflate politics with the state 
simply, and I, I don't think that's quite true, and further, simply because we want to live in a world where politicians who do- dominate our lives doesn't mean that we can simply ignore them. You know, there are consequences that come with elections. And so we've been trying, Ryan and I both have kind of unique backgrounds for our orbit, considering we both used to work in government. Um, you know, he, he works with the uh, uh, Colorado state government and the housing side. And I was in, in D.C. with the Financial Services Committee. So, you know, we have a little bringing a little bit of that into the equation. And uh, so it's, it's been fun. And uh, you know, we're trying to offer a little bit of a different perspective there. And, and really, I enjoy it because I think that Rothbard's uh, some of his work on strategies for liberty is some of his it's some of his most controversial work. And I mm-hmm. think it's also some of his just most underappreciated work. Uh, because, again, the fact that we had someone of his caliber is a great historian, a great economist, a great political philosopher, someone not afraid of engaging with that political arena um, is something that I, I've always enjoyed. And uh, so trying to be yeah, having a, a platform to kind of talk about that and providing a little bit of content that we didn't have a lot of on the on the Institute site has been fun. So, yeah, so we're, we're hoping to keep that going. Is it about once a week? I believe it's dropping. Yes, we've been we've been kind of getting in a pretty consistent uh, uh, rhythm of about Wednesday is when we when we've been recording it, and our studio has been great about the turnaround there. And so we're trying to keep that up, trying to hit it on Wednesday Wednesday as much as possible. And uh, yeah, so it's again, just happy to to have that sort of platform to uh, for Ryan and I to engage with this sort of stuff. Well, as we record this, it's Friday, October twenty third. Last night was a final debate between Joe Biden and Donald Trump, and I purposely scheduled this interview with you to make sure we did it after last night because, you know, there's no point in doing it before when this this is going to be the big news that comes out. So let me start with this. What was your overall impression of it? And let's say what moments stood out to you in the debate? Well, you know, I think that it was for kind of that, the interesting thing is when you look into this, you know, the question always is how much do these debates really matter? And I think that, you know, we always overstate them, um, you know, in the grand scheme of things. You know, I think the SNL's portrayal, portrayal of debates typically has more uh, uh, cachet with, with you know, ingraining certain things in people's minds and the debates themselves. Um, of course, that was back when SNL was, you know, worthwhile watching. <laughs> um, that's not the case for quite a while. Um, but I, I do think, though, that there's perhaps a, a sliver of the electorate that likes Trump's policies better than the Democratic Party. And so that kind of this more composed reigned in Trump might kind of soothe some of them, their fears in a way that might have changed things a little bit at the edges. Um, you know, I, I know that the, the GOP has been trying to make a big deal out of uh, Biden's comments on oil and fracking, um, which, you know, is a, a topic that matters for you know, kind of Pennsylvania in particular, New, uh, New Mexico, as well as, as some of those swing states. I, you know, I don't think Texas is particularly competitive, though the media would like you to believe it is. Yeah. Uh, but, but to me, the, the biggest takeaway, though, is, is like, you know, I, I think it really gets to the core of the you know where american politics really is is the you know fairly uh on its face an offensive line by joe biden that you know, i don't see red states i don't see blue states i see the united states and what's really terrifying that is that you know con- considering the context there of how do you deal with a the, the covid issue what that really is is you know biden doubling down on this uh view of the american union uh, one size fits all government for all in, in, a, in a country as, as large and diverse uh, uh, and varied as the United States. And I think that kind of really at its core hits to why I have a lot of sympathy to Trump uh, in this election, even more than I did in 2016, is that, you know, that, that you know, this, this political policy environment, you know, s- since COVID, you know, really hit the U.S., I think mean, it's highlighted the better you know how how a federalist more decentralized let the states take the lead sort of solution is a l- much better relative to what the you know the mainstream of the democratic party wants and what a lot of other governments in the world have done um and so that's you know that that's the line that i've been trying to, that i i think can really highlight so uh, just why a a new democratic uh white house can can undo a lot of 
you, know, you, you never want to oversell the positives of the last four years, but can, uh, uh, you know, given the, the unique way that a public health crisis can empower the state in all sorts of ways, uh, I, I think that'd be a major step backwards. And so again, something that, that seems relatively uh, benign, I think that's, that was the one line that kind of really you know, made me shiver all the way down. Yeah, I f- found it interesting over the last, I guess now, geez, it's been since March since this lockdown stuff has been happening in various states, as it should, rather than a federal lockdown. I mean, of course, you and I are for no lockdowns, but I find it interesting that some friends on the left wanted a national lockdown and national mask mandates from the guy that they hate. Did that seem odd to you? Yeah, no, it's really interesting. Like th- this is the moment where, like, if Trump was really an authoritarian in his heart, uh, like this is the perfect, perfect scenario, right? Like, you know, and, and again, the biggest criticism has been, oh, well, why haven't you done more? Why haven't you you take a stronger control of the country? And it's just, it, it's it's insane. Uh, but but again, I, I think a lot of this goes to like the, this is a fairly mainstream, you know, view of of the left. That you know we we need one size fits all government. And, you know I, I I've had some some conversations. I you know I, I always try to stay out of my echo chamber on social media as much as possible because I, there's nothing I hate more than a bunch of libertarians just repeating the same lines to each other. Um, and you know so I, I engage with you know twenty something year old you know, you know mostly majority Bernie bro type people and and you know it's you know, not only is it the COVID situation but I mean. Across the board, it's it's Medicare for all. It's it's uh, you know, we need increase the national minimum wage, all this sort of stuff. It, it's this consistent drumbeat of you know viewing all of these issues as national issues um, rather than respecting any differences that exist. I mean, I, the idea of a fifteen minute, you know, dollar minimum wage is very different in New York than it is in uh, Weehawken, Florida, that right down the road here. Yes, um, and and they, they 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 it's interesting seeing them. Not you know, fail to process this in the slightest. Like like when I highlight the absurdity, they're you know they're unfazed by it. It's like yes, like this is exactly what we want. It's kind of it's kind of terrifying. You know when, when you start taking these people seriously, you know what they really want. Uh, they, you know they don't realize why this is a bad idea. That's kind of uh, that's why I, I've I've become increasingly more terrified of the left than I was of maybe in prior years. You kind of like, oh you know plague on both their houses types. Like no, like there's there's some ideas here on that I think are uniquely sinister. Yes. Uh, from, from our friends on the left. Right, right. I couldn't agree more. And I, I actually thought one of Trump's stronger moments last night was the minimum wage, uh, the national minimum wage question. And he pointed out, like, look, $15 in California, I don't know if he specifically said California, but basically $15 an hour in California is not $15 an hour in Vermont. And state by state, it's all different. So putting one national minimum wage makes no sense. And it was countered with one of Biden's weakest moments when I thought he tried to principally say, raising the minimum wage will not cause unemployment or businesses to go under, which, you know, any reading into just surface level economics, you know that he's incorrect on that. But uh, I thought it was interesting when Trump pointed out it kind of made me smile like, okay, here's a guy on a national stage that's elected saying, let this be a state issue. Um, it was almost refreshing. What did you think was Trump's strongest moment last night? Um, yeah, I, I think at the beginning where he was really hitting like, you know, we, we, people can't stay in your base, you know, in their basements like you, <laughs> you know, Joe. I, I thought that was some really good stuff. He, his, his messaging on COVID in general, the last, you know, ever since he got it, <laughs> And he had to spin it, you know. Again, you know, how much of this comes from a a deep, uh, 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 sincere belief in, in in liberty, and how much of it is kind of political necessity? I don't don't know, and really don't care. Um, but you know, any that that entire message of like, look, we've got a lot of people that are suffering from you know from any sort of you know significant lockdown policy. It's not going to get back to work. You know, just seeing that on national television when that angle, that view, outside of uh, you know conservative outlets is is completely unheard of like i you know that i you know i like seeing that on on a, on a stage like that i i hope it resonates I'm, I'm always terrified of just how dumb voters are and particularly like i you know, in florida for example you know you have a lot of 65 plus uh, uh p you know, retirees that aren't relying upon a paycheck to uh to, you know, to buy their groceries um, you know, if you look at some of the polling there, uh, you look at the crosstabs in Florida, like that is an area 
that, that the polling is indicating that Trump is a significant uh, step backwards with that voting base, even while he improved, improved significantly with the Hispanic voters, even black voters. And, and so like, yeah, you know, does saying the truth on that issue, you know, you know, pointing out, you know, pretty common sense stuff. Does that hurt him with, with some people? Maybe. Um, and so, but I, you know, I'll always give him kudos for that. Uh, you know, I think that, uh, it, the, the, it's a shame that, you know, originally it was supposed to be a foreign policy debate. Yes. Um, you know, Trump, Trump was able to get in some good lines about, Hey, you know, why, why isn't it a good thing for us to work, you know, for, for, for us to have a good relationship with you know, Kim Jong-un or whoever. Um, that was good stuff. I think Scott Horton highlighted that, you know, if you take Joe Biden seriously, which I, I can understand is difficult to do, but you know, we probably should. You know, he, if he's basically saying that he would, you know, consider war with Russia, Iran, and North Korea. Yes, and that'd be a, that would be a, a step in the, the, uh, the wrong direction. I would not like that. Um, and so, you know, I, I wish that was given more, but I I think that Trump is at his best. Uh, I think his instincts are at his best on that issue generally. Um, and uh, but but again, it, it was a fairly subdued performance. I, I enjoy the uh, the WWE Trump the mm-hmm. best. I, you know, I, I enjoy the, the you know making the entire thing absurd and 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 you know dominating Biden in a way that kind of you know makes his brain fizzle. And so yeah, you didn't cut you know this wasn't my debate, you know, but it, it was it's it was a you know, relatively I think strong performance for Trump and and um, you know he he hit some some good lines and it was interesting to see criminal justice reform. Uh, how far that's gone, mm-hmm. um, you know, now as, as a mainstream issue. Um, and I, I thought, thought Trump did a pretty good job of calling out, you know, when, when Biden was saying like, oh, well, you know, we couldn't get this done because we had a Republican legislature. So you know, Trump got it done with the same, you know, with a, with a Republican controlled House and Senate. Um, and, you know, calling out, uh, oh, you know, it, it was uh, uh, Obama that built the cages, Joe. It was Obama mm-hmm. that built the cages. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's interesting also just because like, that's such a, a profound pivot from Trump strategically yes. from 2016 Trump where, you know, he's immigration hawk to here where he's he's running to the left of the Obama, you know, intentionally pushing himself, you know, portraying himself as the left of Obama on that issue. You know, how, you know, how that plays with, with a certain part of his crowd. You know, luckily, I think most of them, you know, will follow him anywhere at this point. But that, that was kind of an interesting uh, plot twist right there. It was, and it was one of the lines, I think, probably people like you and myself have heard that line. Well, obviously, who built these cages? Because it was almost the Scott Horton tactic of attacking the left from the left. And I felt a little bit like the first debate. I don't know how much Trump prepared for it, rather than maybe thinking, well, this old man, Biden, is going to, you know, he's not going to, put his sentences together correctly and I'm just going to pounce on him. This one seemed to me like he had been prepped for a little bit because to hear a line like, well, who built those cages, Joe? That just, it doesn't seem like something Trump would have been thinking of leading up to this debate. You know, I I agree. I I think that first debate, he was really just trying to make Joe short circuit. And so he was being as aggressive as possible just to try to make him like have some sort of just like severe meltdown moment. And that, that never really came. And and this one, you know, he he wanted to kind of show. I, I think again, you know, I mean, I think Trump's a pretty, you know, he 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 recognizes what people want. I mean, that's that's always been kind of his best selling point is that like I mean, he he is a salesman. You know, he he's he's full of. You know, he he will never say you know he's sorry. He'll never say he's wrong. But he he will adapt. And I, I think he definitely saw that on this on display. And and I, I think that one of the interesting dynamics going into this election and further is how much Trump ends up shaping the political, the, the, the entire two-party system. Mm-hmm. And I think that some of the, in the focus of criminal justice reform, the, the positioning of self to the left of, of Obama on, the, on the, the, some of the immigration issues, I've been kind of running with a theory that um, you know, the, the prevailing narrative out there has been for a very long time that an expanded electorate benefits the Democrats. And, and that's, you know, they understand it's pretty simple, like, oh, well, you know, the Democrats are offering free stuff. Uh, people that don't show up to vote are more likely to want free stuff. And therefore, uh, your larger electorate, you're going to have, you know, more minorities voting and more young people voting. And, you know, these are all uh, tailor-made democratic demographics. I, I think you could have a very interesting c- scenario now where, and you're seeing this with Trump's polling increasing with uh, Hispanic voters, particularly Hispanic males, increasing with black voters, particularly black males. You know, you have, I, I think that there's this interesting you know, possibility, and it's, it's a lot of it's my own bias. Like, this is what I want to see from America. 
you know, that the real silent majority out there is an anti-political majority, you know, the sort of people that, mm-hmm. that don't vote not because they don't have a reason, they just because they don't like politics in general. They don't trust any politician. Um, and, and so you, you have a political left that wants to politicize every aspect of life and that, you know, you might have people, you know, responding in a way that you know, they're tired of it. And, um, and, and if that happens, if, if that plays out at all, you know, we're, we're going to end up seeing all the projections right now look like it's going to be the largest turnout in a very, very long time. Um, you know, if, if Trump is able to win, I think that there is within that a very positive message that, you know, it just there's enough people that got so sick and tired of having their sports politicized, having their yes. TV shows politicized, having, you know, being concerned about, you know, getting fired because of something they post on social media that offends somebody, mm-hmm. not even, you know, you know, in California, you know, trying to you know, start an online outrage mob, um, you know, there might be a, a backlash to it. And, um, you know, I, I'm, that's kind of what I'm hoping that we see. And I think that uh, what, whether uh, I, I think Trump's someone who might be able to understand that instinctually in a way that, uh, you know, Frank Luntz uh, <laughs> focus group, you know, never would. And uh, so we'll, we'll, I'm interested to see how that all plays out. Do you see at all in this Trump moment and, and presidency that something that libertarians should look upon with positivity yeah, I mean, I, I I think that it's very possible that if that that like I, I'm I'm very concerned about post-Trump politics. Like I think the Republican Party could get much worse. Um, he's got, I think I'm core to Trump's appeal is that it, it it's like culturally conservative, culturally patriotic, perhaps even more more uh, accurately, and economically agnostic. Uh, because there's a lot of libertarian policies that I, I think are very difficult to sell to people who who you know who can't see the unseen there, and so like they want the idea that you know they they like the idea that oh we're gonna have a government pol- a program that's going to cover pre-existing conditions. Right? And I, I I understand that entirely. Um, but what what we've gotten from Trump though is just significant, such a an, a massive increase in distrust. Yes, of American institutions from both the right and the left, and and again, like this could be, we might be living in the libertarian moment, right? You know, it, it's it's possible that from here on out, both parties are going to get significantly worse for their own different reasons. Um, you know, we'll see if the the LP is able ever able to get its act together. I am consistently pessimistic about that idea. Um, so this might be the moment where you have enough. You get, again, you have you have conservatives, you have average everyday Republicans bad mouthing the FBI and the CIA mm-hmm. and any general that speaks out against Trump, and all these things are very good. You have Democrats actively questioning the uh, uh, you know th- that that very notion that I mentioned earlier that you know we should have national one size fits all politi- uh, uh, policy. Um, you know, actively flirting with secession. Um, you know, you have Governor Newsom and, and Andrew Cuomo both that kind of kind of discovered their own inner John Cal, the John C. Calhoun, <laughs> uh, with the way that they've handled some of the COVID stuff, and then of course the, the ultimate. You know, if, if Trump ends up getting one state to seriously talk about and entertain secession mm-hmm. just simply by winning, then he's the most libertarian president <laughs> of you know, in a very very long time, and and one of the most important libertarian figures. If we simply acknowledge and define libertarianism as uh, a breakdown of federal control of our lives, and so so all of these things, I, I think, are are lessons here that you know imperfect political allies. I mean, Trump is certainly no libertarian. Can have libertarian outcomes, and again, and this goes back to the point about the Rothbard podcast yes, and, yes. And, and Rothbard's strategies for liberty. Is that you know libertarian outcomes you know are, are not simply you know, purely libertarian you know a, a massive awakening of of libertarianism per se it is simply skepticism of the state it is uh, embrace of self reliance uh, you know and, and the political decentralization and there, there is a tremendous value to be had in dealing with imperfect political political actors that can deliver a libertarian outcome. Um, than trying to insist that we all need to be uh, like Justin Amash. Right, right. I did a an episode a few weeks back with Lou Rockwell, and we discussed kind of something you've uh, hinted at a few times here is the Paleo Libertarian Alliance from the Pat Buchanan days with Lou and Murray Rothbard and people like Paul Gottfried. And, and one of the things that the Buchanan movement and somewhat the Trump movement has represented is a middle finger 
obviously to the left, but not only to them, but to Conservatism Inc. or Conservatism Incorporated, as, as, as we a lot of us call it. Do you think, well, let me ask you this way. Something I've discussed that I don't hear as much is the term Libertarian Inc. and Libertarianism Incorporated with, with groups like the LP, Reason-type Libertarians, the Beltway Cato-type Libertarians. What advice would you, if you could, give to Libertarianism, Inc., the LP, what would you give advice to them? What, what, what would it be? Well, my, my advice to the LP in particular uh, would be that you know, if, if we're going to talk about third-party politics, um, that we should look at the most successful minor party in recent history in the Western world, and that would be UKIP. And, and you know, UKIP's, you know, they, they had, there's all sorts of, you know, it was, it, was a, it was a broad coalition of people with a variety of ideas, some of them good, some of them bad, um, but it had a very singular, very libertarian focus, which was to get the hell out of the EU. And, you know, it was successful in that. You know, UKIP did it without ever, you know, there, there was never a UKIP prime minister. There was never even a particularly large section of, of uh, parliament that was, you know, under Nigel Farage's control. Um, you know, within the European parliament, they were much better represented, obviously, but they are not within the uh, government in general. And, but it, but it succeeded because Brexit was successful. And I think that, you know, if we take a similar sort of approach, you know, if, if I could uh, have control of the LP platform, I would, you know, uh, control alt delete the entire thing and just replace it with, you know, uh, basically a, a libertarian or a, a, a Mises and liberalism uh, uh, statement about uh, political self determination. And if it was possible at all to, uh, Grant uh, uh, political self determination down to the individual level, then we would represent it. And outside of that, you know, we, we should want localized control as much as possible. And 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 I think that's that would be a much better approach than trying to win over, sell this large set of goods that, particularly when there's so much controversy among within libertarians about what, what libertarianism actually is. You know, let's just get get rid of all that, because again, I I think that the, the mistake that the LP in particular makes is that they see the LP as an educational vehicle, and it's not. You know, the division of labor matters within movements, and the, and the LP has a single job, and that's to collect votes. I think, actually, and Nick Solrick was, was right about that point in his debate with uh, uh, Dave Smith at the Soho Forum, whenever that was. Um, the problem is that his idea on how to collect those votes is, uh, you know, was just very, very wrong. Um, you know, Dave Smith's idea that, you know, Ron Paul was you know, far more successful at that was accurate. And so that would be my suggestion to the LP in particular, to to the rest of Libertarianism Inc. I mean, I I, I don't know how many the beauty. I mean, I, I don't know how many of us are really are on the same side at the end of the day. I think that some of the objectives with you know liber, you, know, you know, Beltway Libertarians, you know, I, I think they they kind of want you know minor tweaks at the edges to, of DC policy. I don't think any of them are really you know, at the, at, you know really care about political decentralization. I mean, I think a lot of them just suffer from this hubris that, you know, what they really desire is uh, libertarianism is good. Libertarianism is obviously good. So therefore, we should be getting as many people under a libertarian government as possible. And I, I, I think that's a very flawed, uh, very arrogant view of, of looking at the world in general. But that is, that's not to say, though, that everything that comes out of those institutions is bad. I think Mercatus is very good at, with their state policy and analysis and a lot of, you know, I think Americans for Prosperity, um, which is another kind of the political wing of the, of the co octopus, um, they've had a lot of success at the state level, uh, particularly here in Florida. So, I, you know, I appreciate that. You know, it's, it's not that everything they touch is bad. I just think that anything that resolves around uh, a respect, respectable or respectability politics within Washington, I think it's just a fool's errand for, for libertarians. Because again, you know, Washington D.C. is the capital of the American Empire um, far more than it is the heart of America, and and that's so, so again trying to play ball with the empire. I think it's just a, a fool's errand uh, for libertarians, and and again, I think it plays out when you see like how many libertarian, you know, Beltway libertarians are just vehemently anti-Trump. Like they they genuinely think that Trump is worse than the status quo before that. Mm -hmm. I you know, it's just, I, I don't. Really, I mean, it's a failure on my part. Like that—that that is a blind spot to me. Like I don't understand. I, I cannot. Usually, I try to, you know, figure out. You know, you know, the, the ideological Turing test. You know, try to. You know, I, I can usually make an argument for why someone has a view that I don't. I, I for the life of me, I cannot come up with a, a genuinely compelling argument 
for why Trump is worse than Obama or Bush. I could understand understand the argument for why he's just as bad, but not worse. Um, and yet, I know like Reason a few few weeks ago published like uh, you know a, a all the members of their team you know talking about how they're going to vote, and you know, to their credit, you know, a lot of them were either not voting at all. Some of them were LP people, as to be expected. Um, but it was like you know, five of them were like, yeah, I'm voting for I'm voting for Biden, you know, without question. And I think he had one Trump voter, and it's like I was, you know, that that would be you know I, I think that if you if you uh, uh, talked to you know veterans of you know a, a lot of like the, the real core like Ron Paul era people um, who are obviously never welcomed by the recent crowd really um, you know it, it, Ron Paul was never a, a figure for those people um, and I, I think that it'd probably be just the opposite in that there's a lot more sympathy for Trump relative to the status quo um, that's certainly where I fell on it. Hey guys, let's take a minute to talk about one of our sponsors, and that is Lorenzotti Coffee. I love these guys, not just because they were our very first sponsor, but because, like I've said many times, their coffee is so damn good. If you guys like coffee that tastes the way coffee is actually supposed to taste, you know, with natural flavors that come from the region and the roast of the beans, rather than from artificial flavorings like some other brands use, well, then you'll love Lorenzotti Coffee. If you're a real coffee drinker like myself, you don't want these weird flavors in your coffee like key lime pie or blueberry muffin. You want strong, traditional flavors that actually come from the beans themselves, and that's exactly what you get with Lorenzotti coffee. You can get Lorenzotti's signature Venetian blend. This stuff comes right from Italy, okay? You can do whole beans, medium fine grind, which that one's actually perfect to use in the French press like I prefer. It comes in these really cool, beautifully designed, resealable tins that ship to you hermetically sealed and keep the coffee very, very fresh. Guys, I cannot speak highly enough of Lorenzati. They're lovers of liberty. They love this show. They support this show. So why not support them by getting yourself some damn good coffee? So go to Lorenzati.coffee. That is L-O-R-E-N-Z-O-T-T-I dot coffee. Guess what? We got a promo code, and that, as you know, is DTTP for Death to Tyrants podcast. You will get 10% off your order at checkout. Again, that's Lorenzotti.coffee, enter code DTTP at checkout. Let's get back to the show. I want to hit on some of the topics that Murray Rothbard, we've kind of mentioned it, wrote about, and uh, more recently, Hans Hermann Hoppe touched upon in a speech in 2017. And Murray kind of called it a strategy for the right. And within that, he talked about a right-wing populism. And like I said, Hans talked about it uh, just a few years ago, kind of gave like a more updated version of it. Within those speeches and and, and writings, what do you pull from most that libertarians could learn from in this current moment and use in this current moment? Uh, Well, I I think it, first of all, it appreciates the fact that people are emotional Creatures, we're, we're not purely logical, and you know, and, and I, I, you know, Rothbard's divide with a lot, you know, like obviously the, the, his his big uh, battle with David Friedman was on the question of, you know, whether or not you hate the state. And David Friedman did not hate the state. Murray Rothbard hated the state, um, and and I think that it's it's interesting. I mean, when you look at a lot of these these libertarianism ink people, uh, at Tom Palmer, for example, with the at, you know, with Cato and and the Atlas Network. You know, he still references this article as exactly on why Rothbard and Hoppe, even though he, he tries to avoid using Hoppe by name because um, it's beneath him, um, you know, he, he points to that himself as like, here's the, here's the core of the disagreement. And, and to me, like, it, it's the emotional arguments beyond the purely logical that are so important to libertarianism. Because most people aren't going to read human actions. They're not going to go through the links that is required to understand the nuances of libertarianism. What they can respond to is the the fact that they're getting ripped off. Yeah. They they are getting screwed over by this machine. And I mean, this is this was you know what resonated with Bernie, so what resonated with Trump voters. This is why there's a lot of overlap between is that both of them, particularly in their prime in 2016, you know, after that, both of them were kind of too mainstream, I think, to to really kind of capitalize on that same message, even Bernie. But you know, getting people to you know upset that, hey, look, the, the system that's here is screwing you over. Uh, we need to replace it. And there, and, you know, Hoppe understood that as well, you know, what must be done. Um, and there's, I think that is where there's so much value. You know, it's, it's not about, uh, 
you know, peace, love, and liberty. It's, hey, why, why am I the one getting screwed? And particularly when you have a class of people that so unjustly benefit from it, too. Like, it's, it's always good to have an enemy. It's always good to have a common enemy. Um, you know, and, and so that's something that, you know, we, we should be leaning into. We should appreciate it. And, and we have the best answers for why this is. So we should be afraid of talking about uh, income inequality to a certain group of people. Um, you know, we shouldn't be. We, we should be willing to talk about uh, debt jubilee. You know, I, I think that's that is a populist, economic populist issue that libertarians should be leaning into. I mean, Rothbard wrote about you know why why should we, you know, force new generations to pay for government debt uh, that uh, uh, their parents and grandparents saddled them with. You know, let's let, let's forgive that government debt. You know, that's those are sort of things that we should be looking for those populist issues where it is a means of acknowledging the areas where policy mistakes and in, in the, the, the U.S. empire of, of Washington, D.C. have created conditions that are harmful to the average working person. And we should try to devise strategies that that leverage that to you know, painting a larger you know, critique and condemnation of the state as a whole. And, you know, so the, I think all of those, is, is, all that's very valid. And of course, I mean, and that's why like some of these ideas, again, like if, if you do have, if we do see that, you know, that the silent majority in America really is that, that anti-political uh, uh, framework, you're, you're kind of, that, that's where they're coming from that I mentioned earlier. That is that, that would be a very good sign on, on what is possible with a kind of a Rothbardian libertarian populist movement um, is trying to tap into that. Yes. And, and, and this is why like, this is some of the, um, content that we've kind of been doing with the Rothbard podcast or with Radio Rothbard is that, uh, you know, I, I think that it's, it's very, uh, Daniel McCarthy, uh, uh, you know, mentioned this on, on Facebook and kind of really uh, played well with some of the other stuff that I've been kind of reading on my own is that, you know, the idea, you know, there's, there's the, the libertarian uh, uh, hatred uh, of, of democracy uh, it, it's something I've kind of, you know, I, I, I love H.L. Mencken. I love, love Hoffa. Like, I definitely you know, I understand a lot of that stuff. Um, and I, I appreciate that. And I, there's, a, there's a ton of you know, important contributions there with like Hoppas. It's almost kind of like a public choice sort of framework there on, on recognizing uh, the, the perversion of uh, incentive structures that you get with a democracy relative to some other forms of government. Um, but at, at the same time, though, is you know, the, the people that are being screwed, screwed over by the state outnumber the ones that are benefiting the state. And, uh, you know, if you can ever weaponize that towards a productive end, there's a tremendous amount of political power that can be wielded within a democratic system in that. And um, that, that was where Rothbard was really going in the 90s. And that's, that's something that there's, you know, it's something that, that we should not take for granted. Yeah, well, well, I want to uh, jump in real quick. He, one of the things he wrote that speaks to exactly what you're saying, we must reject once and for all the left libertarian view that all government-operated resources must be cesspools. We must try short of ultimate privatization to operate government facilities most conducive to a business or to a neighborhood control. And, and I think sometimes within libertarianism, we have an instinct to say like, uh, you know, I don't want to participate at all. That's that's you know that's theft and and that's that's immoral. But at a local level, it can be doable, and you sometimes do have to work within the confines that you're given. Obviously, yeah, our goal would be ultimate privatization of everything. But sometimes it seems silly to outside of that just go well. Then I'm not part of it. No, you're absolutely correct. And, and, and even even worse than like trying to be outside of it, you have a lot of people. You know, the accelerationists of the group that say that, oh, we should be doing everything we can to make public schools as awful as possible. And it's like, I, I understand, you know, you know I, I, I understand where they're coming from. Like, I, I see the logic there. It's just, I don't think it really works out in the real world. Like, I, I think that, you know, pe people, people recognize competency. And, and again, like, you know, the, and, and the beauty of it for libertarians is that, you know, we, we may never get, you know, 50 plus one percent of the population to believe that, uh, you know, we we, sh we should abolish all public schools, right? It's like something so baked in that you know it, that's that's a very, it's a very fringe posi position. I think it's the right position, but the fringe position. Yes. And so the beauty of it is that we don't have to convince everyone that our ideas are one hundred percent correct if we simply show that we are more competent, and you know, in, in other ways so that we're better people than other, you know, than, than our opponents. That goes a long way with these folks, and and that's that's not a bad thing. 
And and so, you know, there's there's ways that and, and I, I think a lot of it goes into to the values of local control. Yes. Um, that's why I, I think one of the, the most important essays that the Mies Institute has published in the last five years is Ryan McMakin's uh, political decentralization is the same thing as radical anar- or as, as uh, anarcho capitalism. Um, it's kind of an unwieldy title, not, you know, not, not the pithiest thing we have there, but the content is fantastic in simply the way that I think it, it does an accurate job uh, alongside a very convenient job of highlighting how Mises' views on self-determination uh, and, and political decentralization are not in conflict with Rothbardian anarchism, uh, which kind of resolves one of the, the, the great Austro-Libertarian disputes there. Um, and and uh, I guess I think there's a, there's a lot of value that if you start thinking in those 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 works for for those that are interested in politics and you know for the people that are perfectly fine not engaged with politics at all like you know God bless you I'm I'm not you know I'm certainly not gonna I'm not a political evangelist in that regard that oh everyone needs to be adapting the strategy but for those that that have always kind of had a soft spot there there there, there are ways I think of promoting radical ideas because we you know, we are very radical in ways that can win over. People that uh, uh, perhaps do not consider themselves nearly as radical as we are. So uh, there's there's value there in, in persuading others to our opinion, even if they don't uh, embrace it, the you know every every single word or or ever read uh, human action. Right, right. Well put. I've got a, I will link to that article in the show notes page uh, for this episode. Before we get you out of here, you're good online. I follow you on social media. With a lot of, you've got statistics on voter registration and what's going on in Georgia and Florida and the areas around you. If you feel comfortable making a prediction, do you have one for the election? So I don't have a bet on the the, the complete outcome, but I think that if, if, if I were forced to place one, I would vote on uh, Trump winning um, prob- probably with a smaller like, electoral college result than 2016. But again, I, I enjoy this stuff way, you know, way too much. Um, so I've been following early voting data um, from the battleground states. And what was interesting with this election, because like the, you know, the, the, the vote by mail COVID environment totally changes the normal data trends and all that. Right. So what you're going to have is a situ- situation. And it's funny because the, the narrative, the mainstream narrative that you've had is that, oh, well, you know, it might look like Trump's doing really, really well on election night. And then you have this slow trickle of vote by mail ballots coming in that may shape things, you know, change things over time. Well, the way that vote, vote by mail really actually works is that the ballots go out well in advance. Um, the people that are really, really motivated to, to vote, you know, turn those around pretty quickly. And so you have a ton of people. You, you have so many more people that are vote that have voted now than the same point in the election, in normal elections. And so you know, uh, on election night, you're going to have those v- those vote by mail ballots counted first. Um, now you know, that's not to say you're not going to have a few trailing in late. Like the, I know some states, uh, Pennsylvania in particular, has kind of you know extended the window for what they'll accept after uh, postmark dates. Fine, whatever. But that's going to be that's going to be a minority of vote by mail ballots. Um, so you're you're having the situation where you kind of see okay what are the states where the the Republican numbers are staying pretty even to you know, as a breakdown relative to Democrats because you're going to have this gigantic wave and you're seeing it in Florida right now with in person early voting you're going to see a gigantic wave of election day voting from Republicans that are culturally just a lot less afraid of COVID um, for a variety of reasons and. Um, and so, like, I, I think there's still very much, in spite of what the polls are telling you, a, a very good chance that Trump ends up winning um, Florida and Wisconsin and Michigan and Pennsylvania. Um, and I, I, one of the examples that I've used to highlight just how off these these polls are is Georgia, because like Georgia right now, I, I, I haven't checked you know in a few hours, but after yesterday's results, Republicans had a two percent advantage. Over Democrats and uh, early voting and vote by mail, you know, there's polls that you know, there's all sorts of data that indicates that Republicans are going to come out in far greater numbers on election day. Mm-hmm. So if they keep that two percent advantage, and it's kind of been a steady trend upwards actually for Republicans, if, if they have that lead going into election day, it's going to be a wipeout. I mean, Trump might win up win Georgia by significantly more than he won 20, won 2016. Meanwhile, the polls show you know Biden with a very small. 
uh, uh, advantage, let's say margin of error, it's you know relatively tied, fine. But the sort of outcome you get there is not representing the polls, and so if the polls are wrong in Georgia, the polls are wrong everywhere. Mm-hmm. And, and and again, there's, there's nothing that'd be better than to, sh- to have this polling apparatus that I think sh- suffers from such of the the same hubris that uh, infects so much of these these you know social science analysis that that. You know they they're so confident in their their you know their their modeling and and whatever um that the quants you know if, if they're humiliated again that's just going to be you know that, that's that's just a, a candy on top from everything else because uh, again the, a lot of the worst people in the world at least in the political analysis world are, are the Nate Silvers that you yes. know want want to, that they, they they can predict everything with mathematical formulas like no it goes goes against the uh, Goes against every part of my uh, Misesian foundation <laughs> right. there, so I, I want them all humiliated. Right. Well put. Well, uh, Tho, do you have anything to plug your social media? Uh, anything you guys at the Mises Institute got coming up? Um, Radio Rothbard, once again. Anything you'd like? Go ahead. Yes, yeah, so we've got a lot of stuff. It's been a productive year uh, with COVID. We've got uh, BeginEconomics.com. We've got which is a, a uh, kind of introduction to economics. Uh, video series that I've I've been uh, working on um, with our team. Uh, if, if anyone out there has has never read Economics in One Lesson by Henry Hazlitt yeah. or want some copies of that book um, to give away to others, I, I'm currently my my goal is to get a copy of this book to every high school senior. Um, so that's when you take Economics in Florida in my county, which would be really, really cool. Mm-hmm. Uh, we were giving a, doing a massive giveaway of that book. Um, it's a new edition with an introduction by Jeff Dice. You can get that by going to Mises.org slash one lesson. And the book is totally free. We cover the shipping and handling. We're just trying to get that book in the hands of as many people as possible, particularly students. Um, and so again, if you have anybody in mind, and hey, you can, you can knock out some Christmas shopping without, you know, for, for, uh, for free there. Uh, that's Mises.org slash one lesson. It's a great opportunity. It's a great book. And we're trying to get that out as much as possible. Excellent. And you can find Twitter at Tho Bishop, T-H-O-B-I-S-H-O-P. I will link to all of that in the show notes page. The Mises Institute, thank you for your service. So that's amazing getting economics in one lesson out for free, including the shipping. No excuses, you guys listening, if you've not read that book. Tho Bishop, thank you so much for being here once again on Death to Tyrants. Well, thank, thank you for having me again. There, there's not, there's, we have so many libertarian podcasts out there. I, I don't spend my time with many of them. Yours is one that I, I recommend um, to everyone. You, you, you're doing fantastic work. And the guy, I know it can be, uh, I, I find myself being very long winded when I do uh, podcast interviews. So uh, thank you for putting up with me. Man, thank you for that uh, compliment. No, you did great. And this is awesome. I love having you on. You're one of my favorite thinkers. And you're young, you're way younger than me. So it's good that we have young minds like this coming up in the movement and spreading good messages like you do, especially on Radio Rothbard. Though, Bishop, thanks, man. Thank you for having me back on. All right. I hope you guys enjoyed that chat with Tho Bishop. Tho, thank you once again for being here. I had a fun time talking to you. As for this show, you already know, guys. You already know. DeathToTyrantsPodcast.com. It's got all the information you need. Our great new t-shirts, the Facebook, the Twitter, the Instagram, the Patreon. All of the stuff you need is right there. And till next week, this political environment's getting crazy, isn't it? Have a great week, guys, and I will talk to you soon. See ya. You get split in fucking half, cause I call him the hologram graph. But I am the center inside the placenta of math. You clash with cyanide gas and die fast. Rhythmical equivalent of solids, liquid, and gas. We smash a sinus with the power of Lord Titus. But I am the virus inside of the iris of Cyrus. Like the sound of the Death to Tyrants podcast? Our audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com.